Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome back to another episode of the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. And before we jump into our conversation today with my very special guest, I want to share some exciting news from my company, Grow Strong Leaders. We've recently released a unique self-paced online leadership development program called GSL Skill Builder. It helps strengthen 36 different character skills and 10 high-impact communication skills that every leader needs to be effective. And it's focused on participants putting a skill into practice, not simply acquiring new information. So there's real behavior change over time. I invite you to check it out on our website, growstrongleaders.com. I could not be more thrilled to introduce you to my guest today, Dan Kent. Dan, welcome to my show. Thanks, Meredith. I sure appreciate it. It's so great to be here. I'm honored and humbled to be on your show. Well, it's going to be just a fabulous conversation. And I want to share some important things with my audience first. As I've gotten to know Dan, I've discovered one of his superpowers is his ability to not only see the strengths in others, but to also articulate them. We're going to learn more about how he does that with clients And I witnessed it firsthand when I was a guest on his podcast, Clearing Obstacles. His introduction of me beautifully captured the essence of who I am and aspire to be in the world. I encourage you to check out that conversation and listen to other ones. He's an exceptional host. Dan is also the founder and owner of Best Self Coaching a business coaching company that strengthens and grows businesses by developing the humans involved in them. He's affectionately known, and I love this, as the loving butt kicker they often need in their lives. Dan, I've also been called a velvet hammer. So (laughs) we have similar names. It is. It's a play off the same. (laughs) Dan's method is a natural extension of his affinity for working both sides of the brain. That's another area we have in common. He has degrees in both accounting and theater arts, almost 30 years in business ownership, and more than a decade in coaching and consulting. That balanced approach, combining left and right brain, has served him and his clients well. So Dan, I would love to start out by having you just briefly tell us about your journey to doing the work that you're doing today with your clients. Gosh, first, what a what a generous and, and uh, warm introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, gosh, the journey to get me here. You know, I started off as a business owner who, as I like to say, I had no business going into business. I didn't know the first thing about what I was doing. And um, it was just one of those follow your passion moments. And my uh, wife's time and I opened a restaurant on the coast of Oregon. And, um, you know, had we done the market research, had we done all of the, the due diligence of operating a business, we probably would have made some different decisions. But Nevertheless, we ran that for uh, almost 10 years and there just came a day when it, when it kind of caught up to us. It was, uh, you know, working baker's hours and we were trying to start a a young family and everything. So, uh, when we closed that, I decided, okay, this is, this is a chance for another career, another, a pivot, another opportunity for me professionally. And I, I was thinking to a person who had been particularly helpful to me as a, a uh, nation business owner trying to figure my way through all of this jungle of things that come with entrepreneurship. And um, it was a, a customer who happened to be a CPA. And I remember her explaining to me some things that, like I said, I just, I really had no idea about uh, when it came to starting a business, just fundamentals. And um, uh, so 
I thought, well, that'd be a great way to help other business owners too, and kind of be in service and and be useful and helpful, and you know, find that icky guy that that uh, sweet spot. Uh, if anybody's familiar with that, and so I went to school for accounting and was on the CPA track, and uh, kind of ended up just discovering that wasn't for me for various reasons we don't need to get into. But um, uh, sure enough, as I'm I'm trying to figure out where to go from there, an ad appeared from a business coaching company that had moved to my small little mountain town that I live in, Ashland, Oregon, a company called Emith, our business coaching company, a book of the same name. And uh, I was trained in business coaching there and and had a partnership with them for, uh, gosh, about 14 years, uh, as long as I've been in business coaching. And it just was such a natural fit because it involved all of the good stuff that I wanted to do as an accountant, but didn't involve certain accounting office politics and kind of like i remember your story about like being a school teacher but the thought of having to navigate school board politics and all of that posturing and all of that stuff the accounting world had a similar kind of dysfunction as far as i was because i didn't Mm -hmm. really want to be in that so all the good stuff about helping business owners that came with business coaching and you know it just felt like a natural fit like you said the introduction i get to work both sides of the brain I get to exercise uh, the technical skills and proficiencies that I've learned, some some the hard way, um, and uh, things that I'm really passionate about, human behavior, um, uh, organizational psychology, uh, emotional intelligence, all of these things that I'm, I'm just so fascinated by. If I do go back to school, <laughs> that's a possibility, it will be to study kind of within that discipline, human behavior and psychology and and social psychology. I'm just so fascinated by it. So I get to exercise that with different clients every day. And and that's kind of the key to that is every every client is so different. They're very similar in certain ways. And yet they all bring their very unique stories and competencies and fears and everything to the conversation whenever we get to work together. So mm-hmm. I can see a lot of variety that way, which also kind of lights my fire. You know, the more we talk, the more I discover so many areas of common ground that we have. No wonder we have enjoyed talking to each other so much because I'm the same way. I, you know, I've been in business for decades now and yet every day is fresh. It's it's different. And, and having that variety is really, I think what keeps me excited, never knowing quite what to expect. And the fact that there are these differences and you and I both are, so focused on our own personal growth. I think it's seeing these as opportunities to expand and grow. Yeah. And one of the things I just love about your approach to working with clients is you really develop this skill that I think is an important leadership skill for all my mm-hmm. listeners, learning to really see people where they are and accepting them where they are mm-hmm. and meeting them where they're at instead of having expectations for them to be somewhere else besides where they are. Talk a little bit about how did you learn to develop that skill and what do you look for to notice? So you get an accurate reading of, of where they are so you can take them from that place and not somewhere else. Ooh, I love that question. I love the way you phrased that question. So the meeting people where they, where they are, I think is, um, uh, I probably developed that early, early on from childhood, just because, and, and, you know, most people have their, their, um, childhood circumstances that hardwired a, a fair amount of who they are today. I'm a big fan of like the Enneagram and, and some of the, um, concepts in that where we, we have developed coping mechanisms or, or, um, a methodology for how we, can feel safe and feel love and belonging in the world. Right. And it addresses that there are a lot of other terrific tools out there, but that one, that one kind of resonates with me. And, you know, if, if you're at all familiar with Enneagram, I'm a type two, so a helper and a helper's always looking for ways to be helpful and useful. And, you know, it, it, when they're being healthy, when they're unhealthy, they're people pleasers and they, uh, they find, uh, some unhealthy ways of expressing that. But when I'm in a healthy space with that, it's, um, it's particularly useful to be aware and exercise that emotional intelligence we were kind of talking about where um, you have to 
you have to be listening not only for what's being said, but what's not being said. What's being avoided? Where's their emotional coverage? Where's somebody hiding? And if you're really paying attention, um, those things stick out like a sore thumb when you're talking to a client. And um, I mean, to anybody, but in the context of your question, when you're working with a client, they will wax on extensively about certain things that they're very comfortable with. And um, so I'll, I'll keep an ear out for, for any little red flags or, or things relative to that. But I'll often almost cast that aside. We'll come back to that later because what I've not heard you talking about is X, Y, and Z. We've, we've spoken plenty about A, B, and C. X, Y, and Z have been relatively untouched here. Let's dig into that for a minute. And you can, you know, we get to do video calls now. It used to be all on the phone. And so you can sort of see them shift in their chair, or kind of stammer or get uncomfortable or even push back sometimes. And that's oftentimes where the where the growth edges are. I love to refer to growth edges as, um, you know, think of a, a mental model almost of two concentric circles, uh, like a two circle bullseye. And that inside circle is uh, your competencies, how how big you are. And by big, I mean like you as a person, who who you really are and, and what you uh, uh, are good at, what your, what your strengths are. Um, and the outside circle is how big, good, competent, whatever you want to be, what, what your aspirations are. And the growth edge is the space between those two, right? You don't have to go from zero all the way to that new version 2.0 of who you want to become. It's just your growth edge. It's just from where you're at today, which is probably pretty functional, pretty healthy, pretty resilient, and where you want to get to from there is the growth edge. And we'll discover those growth edges in very short order in a, in a coaching conversation. Usually like when I, uh, to, to get clients, I usually just offer free coaching uh, conversations. We will take an hour and invariably, even in just an hour, we can pretty quickly discover people's growth edges where they need to, um, where they need to level up and, and then discuss some strategies on how to do that. Let's talk about what some of those growth edges look like. So we take it from the conceptual abstract to yeah. specific and concrete, um, of course, without revealing names or anything, but talk about a couple of situations with clients where here's what you detected them mm -hmm. saying or not saying, and here's where you discovered their growth edge was. Yeah, boy, I can think of a, a whole ton of them. Uh, let's just go with one one example, you know, I had a client who um, really wanted their managers, they, they were in overwhelm all the time. And they had um, a couple of managers on their team who really the only way to get out of the overwhelm was to properly delegate a, a portion of what was on their plate to their managers. But they needed to trust them to be able to do it. So it was one thing to be able to say, okay, here's what I need from you. These are the metrics that I need you to hit or the, the benchmarks that we're, that we're watching uh, as you take on this new task or this new responsibility or project. And um, I want to make sure you have everything you need. Okay, everything's good so far, right? And then uh, two weeks later, they've gotten absolutely no progress this this one client in particular he got absolutely no progress from that because he didn't trust his managers to effectively handle the situation so he equipped them he identified the expectations clarified what those were made sure they had plenty of support they had a good strong relationship but he ended up out of balance in his ability to trust he as a person has a hard time trusting people people let you down right i mean that that's his story and uh, he's he's a great technician he loves getting into the spreadsheets and working mechanical engineering he's an engineer and so he's great in all of those areas because if you change this cell on the spreadsheet you know what's going to happen however if you're dealing with human beings there's this black hole of uncertainty you don't you don't know for sure how it's going to happen you have to trust and his growth edge specifically was, was kind of extended into the personal about himself when it comes to trusting people. 
he had all the tools. He had great delegation mechanisms. He had good project management software that everybody was using. The org structure was clear, but he couldn't get the hell out of the way of his managers to do their job. So he was undermining them at every turn and frankly, compounding his overwhelm. So because of his growth edge of of trusting people and learning how to do that. It's funny, I think you have something on LinkedIn today specifically about trust and breaking trust, <laughs> um, which I, I just loved. Um, and so his growth edge was, was about trusting people and finding ways to nurture that in himself. And, and sometimes, you know, we'll dig deeper and sometimes it's about trusting himself and how he projects that onto others. And so, mm -hmm. you know, business coaching can really store, sort of toe the line into therapy sometimes. When I start to feel out of my depth, I'll let my clients know, hey, I'm. this is probably something to talk about with your counselor more so than me, but uh, this is definitely something that I'm, I'm seeing and I can reflect that back to them. So like that's an example of a growth edge where it played out in in real time in somebody's business. Their, their personal growth edge was affecting mm -hmm. the business their managers, their relationship to the work, their ability to, to do quality work, get the job done and feel like they could own their role. Mm -hmm. And all it took was him just getting the hell out of the way. Well, I love that story and that example because <laughs> there are so many leaders that struggle with that whole area oh, yeah. of delegation. Hey, and of I'm course, one. And so trust, <laughs> you know, is a key element there. I'm imagining different leaders listening to this and realizing, hmm, it would really be useful and practical and important for me to discover those growth edges of each person on my team. Mm -hmm. And so they may not be coming at this with the same skill that you've honed over mm -hmm. the years. What would you recommend for them in having conversations that don't put people on the defensive, that help them open up and talk so that in conversations, in observing their work, mm -hmm. they can discover what are those opportunities for folks that are on my team to grow and expand and become more effective? I love that question because, you know, I'll tell you why. The people that we have in our businesses that are, that are working for us and, and for our organization they are exactly that. They are human beings with dreams and fears and stories and families. And they've got this independent life just as we do as leaders. And when we don't, when we're not keenly aware of that and we don't honor that, we're going to come in, you know, guns blazing with our own agenda and not be mindful of them. And so um, to your question, I advocate, uh, you know, as much as possible, a leader's job is visioning and equipping their people um, as much as anything. And so take your time to do your vision work, innovate, come up with brilliant new ideas, do all of that great leader level stuff and invest the time in your people um, because it, I mean, it's one of the most valuable and I've, you know, I've seen this in, in, real client cases just innumerable times the investment the payback on that investment is incalculable when you have people who feel seen and heard and understood so so how does has one practically do that take the time set up and maybe you you know if you have a company of 100 people you're going to you're going to struggle to get to everybody on your team but at the very least let's say you have a an organization of 100 people and you've got you know five managers managing the 100 people you'd better be really dialed into those five managers because the, the ripple effects of how you're leading and mentoring and listening to them is going to ripple out into those, you know, 20 or so that they're each managing. Now, if you have a small organization, you can very easily have a 15 minute conversation every month to check in with somebody. And if that 15 minute conversation merits an hour long conversation, so be it, lean into that. Allow for your people to feel heard and understood. And when you go into those one-on-one -on -one conversations, which again, I just advocate so strongly for going into those one-on-one -on -one conversations, it's not about a monologue from you. And in fact, it's barely even a dialogue. I would recommend that it that it's 80, 20, 80 them, 20 you when it comes to talk time. Um, you need to come in with curiosity about them, about their circumstances, what they feel like is working, what's not. Um, 
Is there anything you can do to support them? There, there are you know a good dozen questions that, that a good leader could ask of somebody on their team about them, about their reality. And you know, if you want to know the answer to a question, you just have to ask it most of the time. And um, I'll say one thing further. There's a, a terrific, um, and that's when things are running smoothly. You know, you can have, I think, a little bit more contentious relationships with certain people just because of your chemistry or who you are or, or history or stories that, that have come up. And um, there's a great structure that I got uh, um, full transparency from uh, Crucial Conversations, that book, Crucial Conversations. The the structure that was on this webinar that they did is it's a it's a three step strategy for how to communicate in and have a maybe a difficult conversation, and it's three different three different uh, steps if you will. It's facts, story, ask. If you think about it that way, state mm -hmm. and it's based kind of on the nonviolent communication from uh, Marshall Rosenberg. Um, um, what are the facts? What's your story about those facts? And then you ask them for clarification. So an, an example might be, um, so I'm I'm seeing you're having a tough time getting to work on time this past week. Uh, looks like, you know, three days this week, you, you couldn't make it here on time to, to help out your teammates. My story is you're starting to maybe disengage or there might be something going on. Can you clarify me what what this is about so I'm not relying on a false story? So that was a fact. Here's what I'm observing, indisputable. A story, it's my story. Nobody can argue with that, right? There can't be anything terribly contentious about that. And then the ask to, to come at it with curiosity and say, what am I missing here? Help me understand this better because my narrative isn't particularly useful and doesn't make either of us look good. So help me out. And that allows you to have that kind of conversation when it might be a little bit more prickly to keep it, um, like you said, keep somebody from getting defensive or feeling like they're being attacked. You're just stating the facts, what your story is and what your concern is about that. And then asking them, clarify this for me. Help me out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that structure is uh, so much more effective than why are you late? <laughs> Three times right. this week. Right. And, yeah. and having that accusatory tone that immediately causes someone to be tempted to lie yeah, you or bet. minimize. And so it 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 really does damage instead yeah. of helping to bring out the truth and the reality so that you can both respond appropriately and come up with a plan of action that yeah. actually works. What you're describing there to me, ties in so beautifully with the first of the three pillars that you focus on with clients, which is ah, relationships. Yeah. <laughs> and so what you've just been describing has to do with, obviously, the, the person, the leader, and the other individual on their team. But you talk about things like your relationship to yourself and others and to intangibles or, <laughs> or non-people, let's call it, like yeah. money. So let's look at each one of those in turn. What is it that you focus on when it comes to a person's relationship with themselves? Yeah, uh, a person's relationship to themselves has to be grounded in self-awareness. And that's a tough one um, for, for I, I think I can safely say all of us, um, because mm -hmm. we, you know, our ego gets involved and self-awareness sometimes can be confronting. Um, and... Um, uh, we also, you know, there's a paradox there. I think we, uh, what's the, the Dunning-Kruger effect? We overestimate our competence and abilities and in things, uh, including our ability to assess our own competence and ability and things. Um, paradoxically, I think we're also uh, deeply unaware of the power that is in each of us and our potential. And so that there's a real paradox there. And I think true, honest, deep self-awareness helps you get clear on what that stuff is. So um, related to that pillar that you're talking about of, of relationships and a relationship to oneself, you know, uh, the hardest thing to do is to be able to see ourselves objectively, I think, when it comes to relationships. Uh, and that's the probably the biggest challenge that most, I'd say most people, but certainly in the, in the context of this conversation, most of my clients have is 
And the value that I think coaching brings to business owners is the ability for somebody to objectively kind of hold up a mirror and, and let somebody see what they're not seeing and their relationship to themselves. In what ways are they over-indexing for their competence? And in what ways are they under-indexing for their competence or for their compassion or in any of those terrific uh, character building skills that you you guys have on the GSL skill builder. Um, without that self-awareness, their relationship to themselves is going to be, um, you know, it could be as, as toxic as relationship with, you know, their ex or somebody else. We can, we can get in our own way pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious when you're talking with someone, there's some of the, I'll say signals. I was going to say flags. You know, I think of yellow flags and red yeah. flags that <laughs> we pay attention to. But <clears throat> that almost sounds like judging. What I'm looking at is with your skill of taking people or meeting them where they are, mm. and you detect someone has these blind spots about mm. how they come across to others, how they interact or whatever. What is it you do in the form of either asking questions or conversations you have that help them open their eyes and truly be able to see what, how they're perceived by others? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's important that any organization of any size has a mechanism for kind of a 360 type of feedback. So that the leader in particular has some objectivity as to how they're showing up. Um, but then, you know, in my work as a business coach, there are a ton of, I could throw out a bunch of one-liners, like, you know, what's the price you're paying for that? Something that I think is is very easily to be, easy to be dismissed by a person. Um, they, they sort of marginalize the impact of something that they're doing that's not as functional or as useful as it could be. So what's the price you're paying for that? Um, what would somebody else say about that? Um, how do you think uh, that gets in your way? How do you think that serves you or doesn't? Um, so a number of different questions to help somebody just just again reflect on um, with some with some real self honesty about how they're showing up and and try and cultivate that self awareness with them. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I'm a big believer in 360. We've been in that business, of course. For um, 30 years for a smaller company, are there questions that you encourage your clients to ask others on their team to help them become more self-aware? Um, I don't have like a, a particular list. This is where meeting them where they are at is uh, really important. And so I might have, like I said, sort of a, a library of maybe 50 and 10 of them would be appropriate for any particular client. And, and this will be, uh, it needs to be balanced, those kinds of questions. What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? I love the whole start, stop, continue um, paradigm, right? That mm -hmm. a lot of business leaders and, and coaches will ask, what, are, what should we stop, start, and continue? What should we stop doing in this organization or even me as a leader? What, what do you see that I need to stop doing? What should I start doing that I've not, you've not seen from me and what should I continue doing that is I'm already doing, it's going well. And, uh, and you think is useful to the organization or you as a, as a member of the team. So that's a, a really, really good one. I love the five whys concept, um, that, that, uh, I think was, you know, initiated by Toyota in the seventies. I believe I could have the dates wrong there, but it's the, the idea of asking why five times, and there's no magic number to five, but that usually starts to get to the root of a problem. I love the five whys approach. Um, any listeners who aren't familiar with what that is, look that up. It's very easy. I've got some tools happy happy to send you to. Feel free to reach out about that. But you're digging into the root causes of things. And so a lot of the frustrations that people on your team might have um, or the successes that are going on, the root causes of that are likely not as apparent as you think they are. There's, it's probably something that's deeper going on below the surface that is contributing to that function or dysfunction, if you will, within the business. And so um, if there seems to be overall disengagement from the team, it's important to ask why 
more than just once? Well, because they're all a bunch of entitled babies, right? That, okay, why, why do you say that? Well, because everybody's coming to me with raises. Why are they doing that? Well, because, you know, we promised them pandemic level wages when we hired them a couple of years ago. And now that they feel like they, okay, why do you think they feel that? And to, to ask that question enough times until you get to what the root of that is. And in a situation like that, it may be, well, perhaps you set up the expectations that they would have a certain compensation structure that maybe you're unaware of. Maybe we should go back and review that. So that allows us to sort of dig in again to the root causes of something. And that, you know, that's a great segue to that second pillar of expectations too. Yeah. Talk about what you mean by that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll set it up a little bit. There are th three pillars that I kind of, it's almost the lens that I look through in every coaching engagement. And I find it useful in life as much as I do professionally. And those are of relationships, which we just kind of talked a little bit about and expectations and balance. And we can get to that third one, the balance, if we have time. But the expectations are, you know, what are the expectations that you have of others, that they have of you, that you have of yourself? Are they clear? Have they been communicated? Have they been revised over time? And are we communicating throughout those expectations? And, you know, disappointments, frustrations are almost always, I won't say always, because I'm sure there might be some exceptions, but they're almost always rooted in unmet expectations. And like I said, those expectations can be even you with yourself. If you're if you're having a down day, you're feeling particularly icky about yourself, you might have unrealistic expectations or you're not meeting your expectations for whatever reason. So you have to dig into that. So the relationships piece and the expectations piece both um, are, are kind of like... Um, some of the root causes, if you will, I talked about the five whys, they'll, they'll very often end up um, being in one of those three categories, either our relationship to ourself or the other person or a concept like money, like you said, is wonky and we, and we need to attend to that. Or perhaps it's the expectations. Um, we've not clarified them. Um, they've not clarified them with us. Somebody else might have this covert contract thinking that we're going to do something and they never told us about it. So we're, we're making everybody mad in our organization, but we weren't even aware of it. Um, so we have to make sure we're clarifying those mm -hmm. and managing, maintaining them. Yeah. There's a distinction between agreements and expectations that <laughs> I really like. Are you familiar with that? Uh, say more, because I think so. Yes. Well, the idea is that a lot of times we have these expectations like get to work on time or get to mm -hmm. the meeting on time. And yet not everybody has agreed to those being our norms and our standards. So yeah. having that agreement where each party is committing to the behavior that has been laid out is really different than one person having this expectation and the other person not having agreed to it, in some cases, not even being aware yeah. of what that expectation is, the lack of clarity. Yeah, yeah. We, could, we could almost like sharpen the pencil on that and say an expectation can be either mutual or unilateral, but an agreement has to be unilateral. We both have to be on the same page or it's not an agreement. Yeah, and I think that makes a big difference in the outcome mm -hmm. and the commitment that people have to that if they're told you will do this versus let's agree on the standards of behavior here that we're all going to abide right. by. Right. Those, those have different, they feel differently. And I think yeah. they are received differently. Oh, I couldn't agree more. That's the, when you asked earlier, what are some questions that you can ask your organization? That, that is a big one right there around expectations. You know, if we as leaders, send down this dictum of behavior and conduct to everybody. And that might be rooted in, in all kinds of baggage that we have or unrealistic, or there could be all kinds of things sideways about that. And if we haven't checked in with the team and said, how does this feel to you guys? How do you, how does this, like, does this feel like this would augment our culture? Or do you feel like this would uh, compromise our culture and get their feedback on it? Otherwise you've laid down these, again, unilateral expectations that not everybody's necessarily on board with. You got to get that feedback and agreement to your point. Yeah. 
And I think that's where some of the resistance, the disengagement, I mean, it's all interconnected. Isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's a it's a big ecosystem that can get so complicated. And this is where um, having a, a, a mentorship group or a coach or, um, you know, even if you've got a really close management team that, um, and I say close, not necessarily we agree on everything, but we're close that there's some intimacy and trust and we can share the hard truths and reflections with each other when they come up. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you typically work with the um, owner of the business or the most senior executive, or do you work with a team or both? I do both, but I would say it's probably 80-20, probably uh, mostly leaders, mostly the owners. Um, I'll work with management teams and sometimes even, uh, you know, kind of uh, field level employees if if they're a key person that maybe is having a friction point or they need to level up, you know, the, they're kind of being tapped for a, a promotion or, or um, the owner maybe wants to promote them soon, but they're really good at what they do, but we're not sure yet if they're management material, if they're, if they're able to manage people, which is an entirely different skill set than, and then, you know, the, the technical competencies of the job. Yes. So I'll work occasionally with, um, with the employees as, as well. You know, I think it's so wise when a, a business owner, a leader recognizing here are people that have that excel in the technical competence, whether it's yeah. salesperson or some other area, uh, to IT, for example, and yeah. yet do they really aspire to or would they be a good fit for a leadership role because mm -hmm. of the so many people get promoted right. due to so the Peter principle. Technical. I'm sorry. Is that the called the Peter principle? Yes. Is the term that's ascribed to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we promote people right out of their their strengths. Yeah. Yeah. So helping to identify those who not just have the potential, but have the desire or interest in yeah. doing that. I think yeah. is that part of what some of your advising involves or your coaching involves is helping people understand what's really needed to make sure you get the right person in the right position. Yeah, absolutely. Like I have a whole, I have a um, coaching platform that I use. It's called the Clearing Obstacles Roadmap. And there's a whole, an entire section on your people. I, it, I originally named it management, but it just, it didn't feel the same as it needed to uh, with uh, being called your people. And we'll go, we'll walk through that. What are the what are the technical skills that one needs to have, and what are the emotional skills that one needs to have to uh, be an effective manager and or leader? And you know, I, I sort of reduce it down to to the two very simple um, traits that somebody must possess. They have to be both willing and able to assume that position um, because they're they're. Uh, they are mutually exclusive. They can be very easily confused that just because somebody is able doesn't mean it's the job they want. Or by the same token, they can be very eager, ready to climb that ladder. And they just they just don't have the skill sets yet or the maturity or the, the experience. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that third area of balance, because I mm. think that's sort of we're leaning into that anyway with where we've um, been headed. What do you mean by balance and where do you see there being issues that clients need help with? Yeah. So balance is one of those kind of sneaky things that the first two are a little bit more, um, uh, we'll see signs of relationships or expectations that are askew more often in my experience. And we'll see, um, balance being kind of out of whack. And, and I, I usually see, uh, Again, a dysfunction. I say that I've mentioned the word dysfunction a couple of times. I don't mean that with any judgment at all. It's not optimally functional, and so right. um, and and you'll often see that sort of with a Maslow's hammer kind of thing. When the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, everything you see is a nail, right? And um, a, a business owner, for example, or a, a leader who is very relational, they're really great at cultivating relationships with people. They are friendly and warm and empathetic, and that strength has gotten them a tremendous amount of success with their team. 
until it doesn't, until uh, you that becomes sort of out of balance. And now you're letting things slide. You're maybe not holding people accountable to the agreements that you made and the expectations that were communicated. And um, that terrific trait of being empathetic and relatable and um, and 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 very congenial in the way that you uh, relate to folks, it might get in your way because any strength overused will quickly become a weakness or a liability to you. And in that, in a case like that, being relatable and and empathetic, if that muscle's too strong, that's what you're going to use all the time because it's and and naturally so it's what's gotten you to where you're at, but it's not necessarily what's going to get you to where you want to be. And because all of us want to do more of what we're good at, we'll lean into those strengths sometimes with a little too much oomph to the point where they become a liability to us. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's usually where where you know in my capacity I'll point out that imbalance where somebody's strength has has become overused and it's becoming a liability to them. Mm-hmm. So in a case like that, thinking about the original concept of this growth edge, yeah, um, the idea of developing in an area that's different than their strength sounds yeah. like that could be an aspect of moving towards their growth edge. Absolutely right. So, so uh, you know, of say six to seven different disciplines as a leader, you you need to be at least moderately competent in. Right, finance. You got to know. You got to know enough to be able to read your P and L and understand your finances. It doesn't mean you need to do them. Go ahead and delegate it out. But you need to be strong enough in that competency in order to make uh, good decisions as a business owner. Um, maybe, maybe marketing and sales is not your strength. Again, you don't need to become a marketing consultant or expert, but you do need to know enough about it to be able to delegate to a marketing team. Uh, or even outsource it, and then know that they've given you what you've asked for. You got to know what to ask for, and then know enough to know if they provided that to you. Um, and so those growth edges might not be some of the things that you think they are. Sometimes there are other competencies that are required of you as a leader that you've just always sort of skirted by, and you've been able to get away with it up to a point. And then there comes a point where you have other decisions to make, where if you're not attending to financial literacy, you know, you're going to, there are direct implications. You can draw a straight line from your financial literacy as a leader to the compensation decisions you're making for your team. And what's that doing to their morale and their buy-in and their investment and ownership of their part in, in your organization. And so, you know, there are these ancillary skills, for example, that might not be on your radar and that might be your growth edge because, like I said, you've you've been able to succeed just fine without any financial literacy, but there comes a point where that's gonna you're gonna bump up against that. Mm-hmm. You know, as I'm listening to you, Dan, the the theme to me that keeps coming through all of this is it's really hard to see these for ourselves because mm. we're so entrenched truth. in using a given strength. Yeah. Or focusing in a specific area that may be our area of technical expertise and overlooking, excluding, setting aside the ones that don't come as naturally to us, that feel mm-hmm. uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And yet having someone like yourself who can help someone see the full picture, yeah. I think is important for removing those blind spots. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm you know. I'm going to have a biased opinion of that. Of course, I'm a business coach. You you probably do as well. But look, like I said, if, if you got a really strong support group around you, um, you might not need business coaching, but the vast majority of us don't have that. Leadership can be lonely. It can be um, pretty siloed. Um, even, even our spouses or partners might not fully, they may empathize with this, but they're, they're probably not going to understand the nuance of what, what we're going through and what we're dealing with. And mm-hmm. they don't see us in a professional context, professional domain on a daily basis. So they're, they're not necessarily the best sounding board or the best mirror to reflect some of that stuff back to you. Cause they, they might not be aware of it, uh, even if their heart's in the right place. Um, people on your management team, there's kind of a, a, a power dynamic there that might, no matter how healthy the culture is, just the power dyna- dynamic in and of itself 
might keep people from being as direct or blunt or or whatever as as they could be. And frankly, it's not always their job. You know, um, mm-hmm. they've they've got their own stuff to worry about. They can't be your personal coach and mentor and Sherpa as well. So, um, albeit their feedback is really useful, it's probably not coming from thirty thousand feet as it mm-hmm. as it would from a, an external kind of more objective business coach or mentor or consultant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's kind of wrap up here. Is there anything else that you can think of related to what we've discussed that you'd like to either add to or just insert into the conversation? Um, something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and I'll be brief on this. I know you've been real uh, generous with the time here, is uh, as F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote the first, the uh, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function, right? That in, in life itself, but business in particular, has these paradoxes everywhere you look, right? Uh, I've been talking about the growth edges and talking about uh, our own self-awareness. We are vastly unaware of what we're actually capable of. Um, and And if we can be a particular way and show up in life in a particular way, the possibilities are almost infinite. And at the same time, like I said, paradoxically, towards the top of the call, paradoxically, we also have our own um, Dunning-Kruger effect, our own inability and our own blind spots to see what we're not great at. And so um, the best way, I think, to reconcile that paradox is one, allow yourself to be vulnerable about all of that, what you do and don't know, and uh, make sure you have somebody that you can trust to be able to reflect that back to you and sort of sniff test your own self-assessment. Self-awareness is huge and uh, it's not objective. And so we, we need a, another perspective on that very mm-hmm. often. So just make sure you've got, make sure you've got that in your life as a leader somewhere. You know, I love that you brought up the the word possibilities, because to me, so much of what you do and what effective leaders do is actually speak possibility Mm -hmm. into the people they interact with. So just to me, as you have a gift for seeing your clients and what they're capable of, and really not just your clients, people like me, where you pay attention, you recognize, and then you articulate what it is that you see as possible for them. And I know you've worked with one client, I think you said 13 years, this ability to continue to see the evolution of somebody, what are their current growth edges now? All right, now that they've expanded, what's next? What's next? So that ability for you to help people, and I think effective leaders to help others see where their potential lies and then provide the environment that allows them to expand, grow, risk, try things yeah. with support and accountability, both. Yeah. And I think yeah. you just excel in that. It goes back to your, you know, loving butt kicker. You <laughs> you have that accountability piece, but it's in the context of really caring about and serving your clients. And I think they feel that from you. And oh. that's why you have the longevity, the the credibility and the relationships that you have been able to forge over the years because you bring that yourself in the way you interact with them. I appreciate that. I I, I hope that is the case. And um, you know, I have my own business guy. I, I eat my own cooking here. I have my own business coach and she'll she'll reflect that back to me and she'll call me on it when I'm when I'm not. And um uh but I'd like to think so. I absolutely love every client I've ever worked with. And and that might sound a little bit corny, but I I, I very quickly develop a, a very unique level of um, emotional intimacy with my clients because like I was speaking about that that loneliness and again, no judgment with that at all. It's, it's just conditional part of leadership. Um, I get to be trusted by my clients to hear the truths that they probably don't have the opportunity to speak to 
many, if not anybody else. And um, uh, from that place of, of true love for who they are and uh, being able to see their possibilities, hopefully they're, they're um, gaining from that as well. I mean, that's the, that's the ideal outcome, isn't it? That's great. Well, please share, Dan, how can people connect with you and learn more about the work that you do in case they'd like to contact you? That'd be great. Um, yeah, I'm website is bestself.coach. And um, there's uh, plenty of information there about how to work with me, as well as a link to my podcast, Clearing Obstacles, that you were on uh, last week as well, um, at least at the time of this recording. And um, go into bestself.coach. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn and have a presence there. So you can uh, find plenty of my content there as well. Um, and uh, give a quick plug for, um, I'm just, I haven't even announced it yet, at least as of this recording, I'm, I'm going to give away for free. I, I mentioned that clearing obstacles roadmap earlier, kind of that um, structure and platform that I use with all of my coaching clients. I'm giving away the self-management uh, which is kind of the self-organization module for free so that business owners can get traction and um, and get some quick wins that lead to long-term results. Most business owners don't have the capacity to address the things that are frustrating them because of, of a lack of an organizational operating system. And so um, I just figured, you know what, it's high time. I can sell this, sure, but I, I'd really rather just give that, that away for free, let people get some traction realize the value of, of what that means. So go to bestself.coach slash free for that if anybody's interested in that. Great. Well, we'll add that to the show notes page. So cool. all my listeners, no matter when they're listening to this, yeah. will be able to get a copy of that. That Dan, will thank be available. You again for being with me today. I've just loved our conversation. I knew I would. And it's just <laughs> I always, always love talking with you. It's always a joy. We're just alike in so many so many ways to me, the important ways that count, right? In terms of I our agree. values and and just common interests and our commitment to helping people really see who they truly are and then yeah. help them step into that over time so they yeah. can be their best selves for themselves and for others. So thank you yeah. again for the great work you're doing in the world. Thank you, Meredith. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.